Welcome, and in this session, we're going to be reading Matthew chapter 14. Now, this is a very exciting chapter, a very interesting chapter. We're going to be talking about a few very interesting things. Number one is would be the, the fate of John the Baptist. We're going to be talking about the 5,000 being fed miraculously. We're going to be talking about a lot of these different, give you some nuggets, what I call, nuggets of, uh, of, of truth, gold nuggets to chew on. And we're also going to be talking about Jesus Yeshua walking on the water. Verse 1, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report concerning Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the baptizer. He is risen from the dead. That is why these powers work in him. Now, let's just stop there for a second. Obviously, Herod didn't hear about Jesus until after John the Baptist died. So after John the Baptist died, Herod heard about Jesus. And apparently what he heard was so powerful, so amazing, he thought it was John the Baptist risen from the dead. That is why these powers are at work in him. Verse 3, For Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Here we go again, just like Adam listening to Eve we got evil coming out of it. Samson listening to Delilah. Evil coming out of it. <laughs> you know, we got David and Bathsheba. We've got Herod and Herodias. Verse 4. John said to him, Yochanan, this would be John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, said to, uh, said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her. It is not lawful. Obviously, John was talking about the law i.e. God's law, a.k.a. Torah. Okay, some, of the, some Jewish people today believe that Torah is only for the Jewish people, not for the Gentiles. Listen, don't believe that. Okay, We got Yochanan here holding Herod responsible for not obeying Torah. It's not lawful for you to have her. Verse 5. Consider Herod here. I mean, he was... Believer? That's very questionable to say the least. Um, verse 5. When he had, when he would have put him to death, when Herod would have put John the Baptist to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias, here we go, another another one of these, you know, another another woman in the scene here, and the daughter of Herodias danced among them and pleased Herod. Now, what kind of dance with this was this that pleased Herod so much? It says, uh, therefore, he, therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she should ask. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, that must have been some dance. Uh, what kind of, this would be some live uh, show. Uh, what's going on here? You know, um, verse eight. She being prompted by her mother said, being prompted by mother, said, give me here on, the, on a platter the head of John the baptizer. The king was grieved because, but for, his, for the sake of his oaths and of those who sat at the table with him, he commanded it to be given. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. His head was brought out on a platter and given to the young lady. And she brought it to her mother. Sick lady, isn't it? Verse 12. His disciples came, took the body, and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place apart. Now I think, it doesn't say this specifically here, but I think that Jesus probably just went away to mourn the death of, of, uh, of, of Yochanan, John. When the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. Okay, so let me just stop here for a second. Did you know that there are a few places um, throughout the East that claim to have the actual head of John the Baptist still, you know, in possession, intact? In there are actually, there's also another place that claims to have the foot, or excuse me, the... Um, uh, a tooth from John the Baptist and in a hand and an arm from John the Baptist. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. 
a lot of artifacts, you know, from Bible days. Lots of, if you look it up, there's lots of different artifacts. I mean, people, uh, there's, there's some uh, you know, churches that would claim to have the sword or the spear that was used to be uh, thrust through Jesus' side while he was on the cross, claim to have, you know, the, um, the nails of, uh, that was used to, to nail him to the cross, uh, claim to have uh, some of the wood, some pieces of the actual cross of Christ. On and on and on it goes. You all have heard of the sh Shroud of Turin and, and such like that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of artifacts. There's a lot of relics still uh, around, or at least claimed to be original relics. Very, very interesting. Verse 14, Yeshua went out, Jesus went out, and he saw a great multitude and had compassion on them and healed their sick. When evening had come, his disciples came to him and said, This place is deserted and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. They're hungry. Verse 16, but when Jesus said to them, or but Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Ha! <laughs> Here's only 12 guys. And I'm sure they probably didn't carry very much with them. 5,000 men. 5,000 of them. Okay? A great multitude, it says here. They told him, we only have here five loaves and two fish. Only five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, again, you got to understand the loaves of bread back then weren't like loaves what we have today. It was more like uh, you know, like matzah or challah maybe. Uh, five loaves of bread and two, fi two fish. So Jesus said, he said in verse 18, bring them here to me. He commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed, broke and gave the loaves to the, to the disciples and the disciples gave to the multitudes. Isn't that interesting? You know, Yeshua would say a blessing over the food. Now, I got a question. Would it be the same blessing that Jews say today? Perhaps. Or perhaps a little bit different, but uh, something to think about anyway. Verse 20. They ate, they all ate and were filled they took up 12 baskets full of that which remained left over from the broken pieces. Those who ate were about 5,000 men in addition to women and children. Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. After he sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain by himself to pray. Okay. When evening had come, he was there alone. Okay, now verse 24. Just before we get to verse 24, I want to say something again about the multiplication of the food. Is this miracle new? Did God ever multiply something before in the past, in the older scriptures? Yes, he did. You know, you think about how in the days of Elijah, he multiplied the oil for the widow. You know, he multiplied, uh, he did miracles like this before. So no, it wasn't new. Jesus didn't do anything new. Um, generally speaking, he did what we read about that God did all along. Like he said, what my father does, I, I do. You know, what, I, I just do what my father, what I see my father do. Verse 24, but the boat, the boat was now in the middle of the sea, distressed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, and it says here in the notes, the night was equally divided into four watches. So the fourth watch would be approximately 3 a.m. to sunrise around that time. Jesus came to them walking on the sea. So you think about it now. There was waves, there was wind. It was like stormy out and Jesus was walking on the sea. I got here in my note here, see Job 9 verse 8. So Job 9 verses, uh, verse 8 says, He alone stretched out the heavens 
and treads on the waves of the sea. Job. Okay. So, Yeshua here is walking on the waves, the, the, walking on the sea. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost! <laughs> like, they, they could not comprehend the fact that it could have been Jesus himself in the, in the flesh walking on the water. It's a ghost. Only ghosts can do that. They cried out for fear. Verse 27. Now, I find it very interesting, too, that they, even back in those days, they, they knew of the concept of a ghost. They knew about ghosts. Hmm, interesting. Verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Cheer up! Now, in the original manuscripts, he doesn't say, it is I. He doesn't say, it's me. He said, cheer up. I am. I am. For those of you who don't understand how powerful that is, when Moses had the encounter with God, he said to God, when I go back to the people of, to my people, they sent this and they asked me, who is it? This God of Israel, what's his name? What's your name, God? What was God's answer? I am. I am that I am. So this here was an awesome, awesome, awesome. <sighs> that doesn't even begin to ex- explain how powerful and great this experience was and what it really meant. Cheer up. I am. Don't be afraid. Peter immediately. And Peter, Peter's always got, he's always like the first one to jump in. You know, if you notice that, Peter's like the first one to say, you know, to say, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He's the first one to the tomb. You know, he's the first one to outrun the rest of the disciples. You know, he's the first one to stand up and speak at the day of uh, Pentecost. You know, Peter answered him and said, he's the first one to speak up here. You know, some people are kind of like the ones that lay back and they're the last ones to talk. Peter was the one that was the one that was the first one. He was right in there. Right? He was like, P- Peter answered him and said, Lord, if if it is you, or if that's if you really are the great I am, if you are the I am, command me to come to you on the waters. Verse, 20, verse 29, and he said, come. Peter stepped down from the boat and walked on the waters to come to Jesus, to come to Yeshua. But when he saw that the wind was strong, when he saw that the wind was strong, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out and said, Lord, save me. See, he had his eyes on other things instead of having his eyes on God. He had his eyes on the trouble instead of having his eyes on Yeshua. Verse 31, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, even though I doubt uh, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him, and said to him, Oh, you, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they, got, uh, when they got up into the boat, the wind ceased. So isn't it amazing the wind didn't cease first before Jesus started walking on the water? So Jesus wasn't walking on still water. He was walking on the waves, stormy water. Isn't it interesting that Jesus... Didn't that the God didn't make the wind still until after the fact? He let Peter go out on the uh, out on the water while the wind was still blowing. He didn't he didn't stop the wind first. Said, okay, okay, Peter, I'll make it easy for you. Verse thirty three: Those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, worshipped him, saying, "Truly, you you are truly the Son of God." <laughs> I'm sure everybody would say that if they saw what these what the, what the disciples saw. Verse 34. He said, now, this is an interesting point, too. Jesus didn't do these kind of things, you know, amongst his enemies. He didn't do these kind of miracles. He didn't, he didn't show himself like this to the Pharisees, to the scribes, at least not to the general population of them. Because we know that Paul himself was a Pharisee. We know that Nicodemus was a, you know. So we got... Some Pharisees that were good, 
good Pharisees, but generally speaking, most of them were not. Verse 34, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, or to the Gadarenes, uh, as it says in in another uh, part of Scripture. When the people of that place recognized him, they sent into all the surrounding regions and brought to him all who were sick. And they begged him that they might just touch the fringe or the tassel of his garment. And as many as touched it were made whole. Again, the fringe here, look it, look it up in the original manuscripts. It means or it refers to tzitzit, which are the tassels that Jewish men wear. Jesus went around like Orthodox, like an Orthodox Jewish man wearing the tzitzit, the tassels. Now, if you read about it in, in the book of Numbers, the seats that God commanded a Jewish men to wear the tzitzit, which are like tassels with a blue thread in it. And though that blue thread, that the, the tzitzit in itself, it was symbolic of the Torah. Uh, and so to touch tzitzit is an act of humility, is an act of honoring and worshiping, is an act of, of, um, of acknowledging the importance and power of God's law. It's actually an, an act of repentance, or at least a symbolic act of repentance. When you reach out and you touch the rabbi Zitzi, that was symbolic of, of repentance, turning to God's ways, God's, God's word, God's law, the Torah. Read it, read it for yourself in the book of Numbers. The Zitzi, the tassels, are represented. They're, they're actually, the purpose of the Zitzi is to, is to remind you to obey the commandments. Okay? So when somebody went to the went to a rabbi and touched and reached out and touched the seat seat, touched the fringe, the tassels, they were symbolically saying, I turn away from my from my own from my old life. I turn away from my sins. I turn to God. I turn to your ways. I turn to your law. I take hold of that. Even today in, in synagogues, they take the seat seat and, and they kiss it. They kiss it and they touch it on on the Torah. Okay? So, it's important to understand the culture, the context. You know, a lot of people say context, you know, take it, take a scripture in context. And a lot of times, you know, people who don't really know their stuff, they (laughs) don't really know what they mean is a lot of these really uninformed, you know, lesser informed Christians would mean when they say take a take a verse in context, they mean, well, just read the few verses before, a few verses after. But it's much more than that. It's more than just reading a verse before, a verse after, you know, a chapter before, a chapter after. It, it's not it's reading the whole book. It's reading the whole entire context of scripture. Everything from beginning to end. Everything. It's it's about culture. It's about knowing the culture and what people understood in those days, what what they understood things to mean. You know, I mean, like, for example, not that long ago, the word gay just meant happy. Okay, so you got to take it in in context of the culture and the time. What did this particular thing mean? What did this word mean, this phrase mean, this action mean? Back then, and sometimes it's um, it's pretty hard to really know. Uh, we got to do our best to try to decipher it or try to interpret it. So may God enlighten the eyes of your understanding, give you understanding above all your peers. May God give you revelation and show you great and mighty things as you go. And and remember what we just read. Keep the Word of God before you in your mind, in your heart, at all times. God bless you and thanks for watching.